when we focus on the breath, we're monotasking. We've got one thing to do right now, and that's to stay with the breath. And for those of us who are used to multitasking, we feel at loose ends. It's as if we'd grown lots of extra hands to take care of all of our multitasks all at once, and now our extra hands don't know what to do. That's when it's good to think about the fact that even though the breath is a single task, it's a monotask, the Buddha gave 16 instructions for how to stay with the breath. There was a time when a monk told the Buddha that he was already practicing breath meditation. And the Buddha asked him, well, what kind of breath meditation are you doing? And the monk said, well, I just let go of any thoughts of the past, put aside any hankering after the future, and then with equanimity stay with the present moment as I breathe in and breathe out, which is a very simple one technique breath meditation. And the Buddha said, well, there is that kind of breath meditation, but it's not the kind that gives the best results. And then he laid out his 16 steps. The important thing to remember about the 16 steps is that there are actually four different perspectives. And what you're doing is you're meditating. They give you four things to focus on. I remind you that there are four things that you got to take care of. Because as with any genuine monotask, when you really focus your attention on it, you realize there are lots of parts to it, and lots of sides to it. Most tasks, when they get squeezed into a multitasking environment, get stripped down to a single basic thing. You get a very one-dimensional task, or maybe two, two dimensions. But when you stay with the breath, it's full. You're aware of the full body. As you breathe in, breathe out, that's what you're working toward in, in the body side. Gain a sense of how the breath has an impact on the different parts of the body, and then you try to calm that impact. First you allow it to, as the Buddha says, seep and permeate through the body. So whatever part of the body needs nourishment gets the breath nourishment it needs. And that's when it can calm down. If it hasn't been nourished, it's not going to calm down. It's going to be irritated. That's the body side. Then there's the feeling side. How do you breathe in a way that allows the potentials in the body for pleasure and rapture to show themselves? Where are those potentials? If you sit very still, don't let the motion of the body or the motion of the breath run over the sensations that are already there. Just allow each sensation to have its little space. You begin to realize there are some parts of the body where there's a potential for fullness. Everything seems balanced, just right. As you breathe in and breathe out, protect those spots. And when you can maintain them, you allow them to grow. This is part of what nourishes the body. These Different facets of the practice are not totally separate. They're all together. Then you begin to notice it's how you perceive the body that allows these feelings to happen. And the Buddha talks about metal fabrication. This is what he's talking about. He's talking about the feelings and the perceptions, those images of the labels you have in the mind. What's your image of the breath coming in? What's your image of the whole process of breathing? If it feels like it's creating a rough breath, I'll try to change it. Think of it as something much more subtle, the breath seeping in through the spaces between the atoms. Whatever image you hold in mind that allows the breath to flow without any obstruction anywhere in the body at all, and allows everything to connect up. This allows for the feelings to grow calm as the perceptions become more and more calm, have a more calming effect on the mind. That's the feeling side. Then there's the mental side. You have to be aware of what state your mind is in as you sit down to meditate. Is your energy level up or is it down? Are you feeling in a good mood or are you feeling down? Is your mind jumping all over the place? 
Well, there are antidotes. Even though this is a, this is a mono task, there are other techniques you can bring in to help. One of the first the Buddha talks about is gladdening the mind. How do you gladden the mind? Well, you can think about the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. What aspects of the Dharma you find inspiring, or the Buddha's example, how you find that inspiring, or the example of any of the members of the Noble Sangha, men, women, children, old people, young people, people with problems a lot worse than yours, and yet they were able to overcome them. And think about yourself. The Buddha has you think about your generosity and your virtue. I remember reading one time about a woman who was studying in Asia, and her meditation was beginning to get very dry, and her teacher told her to reflect on her virtue. And all she could reflect on was how she had broken precepts in the past and all the other horrible things she did, and that, of course, got her in a worse mood. He said, no, no, think about the positive things, the times when you did stick by the precepts. And it's notable that most of us have trouble doing that. But it's good to remind yourself. And if you have a lot of trouble reminding yourself, I can go out and take the precepts and be very careful about observing them. So you notice, okay, you had the chance to break that precept, but you didn't. The same with the reflection on your generosity. Remember, this practice is not just meant to be squeezed into the cracks of your life as it already is. You have to ask yourself, is this the kind of life that's conducive to meditation? And if there's not much generosity in terms of material things, or your time, or your energy, or your knowledge, well, go out and be generous. Find opportunities to be generous that make you feel good, that lift your spirits. It doesn't have to cost any money at all. Just find some time to be helpful to somebody. That's a form of generosity, to share something that you have in terms of your knowledge, your energy. And then when you sit down to meditate and the mind starts feeling dry, you can reflect on that. Now you find that one act of generosity can be reflected on only a limited number of times before it starts getting dry. So you have to keep it up. It's a part of the practice all the way along the line. So those are some of the ways in which you gladden the mind. Then the Buddha says, if you find that the mind is jumping all around like a ping-pong ball, you've got to steady it. If you find that focusing on one spot in the body is not enough, okay, focus on two at the same time. I know a retired school teacher in Thailand whose, whose technique for getting into concentration was to, as she said, Think of hooking up a battery to two spots. One spot was in her head, the other spot was in her tailbone. And there was like a, there was an electric line connecting the two. And as soon as the battery was hooked up to both both poles, okay, the light came into her body. Now, whether or not you get light, for at the very least, you can get really riveted into the present moment that way. Another way to study your mind, you want to use butto as a meditation word. Just think of it, every cell in your body is saying butto as you breathe in, as you breathe out. There's no part of the body that's not participating. That can really get you fully into the present moment. You really want to inhabit the present moment as fully as you can. Because if you don't inhabit the present moment with good breath energy and good awareness, who's going to be inhabiting your body? What energies are going to be inhabiting your body? You don't know. So take this as an opportunity to settle down. The third step the Buddha gives is releasing the mind. In other words, if you find there's something burdening the mind, a particular thought, try to locate where in the body there's the physical sensation that corresponds to that thought. There will be a little hitch or a little bit of a spot of tension. See if you can breathe through that. Over something really tenacious, ask yourself if you can think it through to the point where you realize that it's you have no desire to be with that thought at all. And part of you say, well, may say, well, I already don't want to be with that thought. 
But maybe you're hiding the other part that does like to be with that thought. Remember, the mind has lots of different agendas going on all at once, and especially if you've been a multitasking mind. Some agendas will hide behind others. You have to create a space in which you're able to allow them to come to the surface and you can see them for what they are. And then you can let them go. That's the mind part. So it's the body, feelings, mind. These are the main elements in the breath meditation. The fourth set of steps. The beginning has to do with how you deal with distractions as they come up. The Buddha recommends seeing them as inconstant. Anything that you're going to be thinking about that pulls you away from the breath. Okay. Remind yourself, this is not lasting. This is not reliable. Whatever pleasure it, it promises is only going to last for a little bit of time, and then it's going to change. If you want, you can watch the level of stress that goes up as you think about something, and then try to notice how it goes down when you let it go. Whatever way you can think about these distractions, it allows you to let them go. Sometimes you don't have to think about them that much. Just notice oh, this is a distraction, you drop in your back. Other times you have to question and probe, why is this keep coming back, coming back, coming back? If you can't figure it out, well, just ignore it for the time being. It can have a little bit of space in your mind. But you don't give it the whole mind. You've got your object here with the breath and the feelings and the mind state. You've got plenty of things to keep you occupied. And when you finally develop that sense of dispassion for it, then you can let it go and you're back to the breath. So even though this is a mono task, it's not a monoculture. In other words, it's not just one type of tree again and again and again and again. There are lots of elements to this one skill. You're balancing lots of different things. So it may take a while to gain that sense of balance, but realize that it's really worth the effort and the time. One of the main problems with multitasking is it teaches you to be very impatient. You want something done as quickly as possible because there's the next thing that has to be done and then the next. But this is a task where you're planning to move in and stay. It's the difference between renting a hotel room and actually moving into a house. With a hotel room, you don't have to take care of it. You don't want to spread out too much because you've got to pack everything up and move. But here you're going to move in and spread out, settle down. So it takes a different range of skills, but they're all very worth developing, because then this is something you can carry out in the rest of your life, and again, not as one more task to do in the midst of all your other multitasks. This is the foundation where you stand as you do your other tasks. But if you're going to stand here, first you've got to make this really solid and balanced. It takes time, and it takes patience, and it takes careful attention. But it more than rewards the effort put in. 